to introduce Nancy. Nancy Polyronopoulos earned her bachelor's degree from the University of British Columbia and has over 20 years experience in nursing. She completed her neurosciences certification and was involved with the provincial and national neurosciences nursing organization as a member of the scientific committee and has presented at educational events locally as well as nationally on various topics for neuroscience nursing. Her career in neurosciences has focused on DBS for the last seven and a half years. Nancy currently works as a clinical resource nurse in the Deep Brain Stimula uh, Stimulation Clinic at Vancouver General Hospital in Vancouver, BC with Dr. Honey. And you will likely see her as part of the nursing team if you undergo DBS. Nancy, welcome and thank you for presenting for us. I'll pass it over to you now. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here to get a chance to talk about deep brain stimulation. I'll just uh, expand a little bit on what you were saying, Alana, about uh, the deep brain stimulation clinic. Um, I work at Vancouver General in the deep brain stimulation clinic. Uh, our clinic has been around for about 13 years and has, is staffed by three full-time nurses at present. And we have between seven and 800 patients that we follow on a routine basis. And currently we are implanting about 70 new DBSs a year. So our population keeps growing, which is, which is great for the program. All right. So today, what we are going to talk about a little bit is what is DBS or deep brain stimulation. You'll hear me call it DBS just because it's easier than saying the whole deep brain stimulation every time I talk. So what is DBS? How does DBS work? What are the benefits? Who might be a good candidate? In British Columbia, how do you go about getting deep brain stimulation? And what's involved? What's, what's involved with the surgery and the aftercare? and then a little bit about the outcomes of DBS and, and the future of DBS. All right, so what is DBS? Let me just get this video going. Deep brain stimulation is, oh, get a little technical difficulty there. Deep brain stimulation is not a new procedure. It's been around for quite a while. It was first approved in 1997 to treat Parkinson's disease tremor. And then in 2002, it was approved to treat uh, motor fluctuations and dyskinesia related to Parkinson's disease. At Vancouver General, we've been, the earliest chart I can find in our, in our office is from about 2004. So it's been performed at Vancouver General for quite a while. Uh, the duration of deep brain stimulation lasts for quite a while, and it can vary from patient to patient, but in the majority of cases, uh, it lasts for many years. Uh, we have patients that have been followed for 10 to 15 years that are still getting benefit from their deep brain stimulation. So what is deep, deep brain stimulation? It's a treatment for certain movement disorders, and such as Parkinson's disease. And the deep brain stimulator sends electrical impulses to certain areas of the brain that are responsible for controlling the body's movements. It's not a cure for Parkinson's disease, and it does not prevent the progression of the disease. The goal of deep brain stimulation is to improve your movement, and it results in a reduction of tremor, uh, stiffness or rigidity, dyskinesia, which are the, the wiggly motions, and dystonia that can be related to Parkinson's disease. Let me just flip through right here. So these are just uh, some of the components of the deep brain stimulator. Okay, this fine, this fine wire that you see on the inside here is the actual electrode that we put into the brain. I have a close of it up of it. I'll show you in a minute. It's a thin insulated wire that is inserted through a little tiny hole made in the skull and implanted into the brain. The tip of the electrode is positioned within the area that we're targeting um, and that's where the electricity comes out of. 
The extension is this thicker white wire that you see here. It's again an insulated wire that's passed under the skin of the, the head, down the side of the neck, into the chest, where it connects to the neurostimulator. And I, there's three examples of different neurostimulators that you see on your screen here. Uh, the one at the top is a one-sided uh, stimulator. So if you're having DBS on one side of your body, we may implant this one. If you're having DBS on both sides of your, your body, for, or for benefit but for both sides of your body, we'd implant a slightly bigger battery, which is this square looking one here. And then for some patients, uh, we may choose to implant what we call a rechargeable battery. We usually don't implant these initially, uh, we usually wait, and if you go through the batteries fairly quickly, then we would probably choose to put in a rechargeable, but not initially. All right, so this is just a picture of the electrode. This is a dime right here, and if you look at the tip of this electrode, there's four little spots on it. You can see some segments. This is These are each called the contacts. Okay, and on each electrode that we implant, there's four contacts. And what we're aiming to do during the surgery is to implant these contacts within that targeted area within your brain. And then when we stimulate them, that's where the electricity is gonna come out and modulate or hopefully change your movement. So it's quite a tiny area that we're actually um, targeting within your brain. So this is what it looks like again when it's implanted. You can see there's electrodes deep in the brain attached to a wire that comes down behind one of your ears. Usually it can be either on the left or the right chest, it, it doesn't matter. Comes down the side of your neck and then the battery is implanted in your chest, usually just below the collarbone. But for some people, for cosmetic reasons, or if they're very thin, we may choose to implant the battery in the, the abdomen. Uh, but generally the chest for most people. Okay, so what does DBS help with? I'm sure some of you have seen this picture before, this um, um, the Parkinson's iceberg. As all of you know, Parkinson's consists of many different symptoms. Uh, both movement related and uh, which we know are things like rigidity, tremor, bradykinesia, postural disturbances. And these are what we call the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Okay, But there's also a whole bunch of other symptoms that, are, that occur with Parkinson's disease that are what we call the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Things like speech difficulties, swallowing, um, mood disorders. Uh, difficulties with your blood pressure, all these sort of things down below here. What DBS helps with are the motor symptoms. So just the things you see on top, the rigidity, the tremor, the slowness, the postural disturbances. These are the things that DBS can help with. Okay. So what symptoms does DBS help with? Well, number one, motor fluctuations that don't respond to optimal optimization of your, your Parkinson's medication. So you're still having on and off periods. They can be quite severe on and off periods. Um, and even if you space your meds closer together, you're still not getting on time through that complete uh, period of time between doses, or you take your meds uh, you go from an off into an on and then to and then overshoot the on into dyskinesia and then you come off again and that cycles throughout the day. So those are motor fluctuations that we talk about. I'm just going to skip that slide for now. Dyskinesias. Patients whose motor symptoms may respond to higher doses of medication, of Parkinson's medication, uh, or more frequent dosing, but they can't tolerate these higher doses due to severe dyskinesias. And third, uh, patients that have uh, uncontrollable tremor despite taking optimum medication. Okay. 
And again, the things that DBS doesn't help with are things like your balance, your swallow, your speech, your memory, your thinking, um, depression, anxiety, constipation, or progression of your Parkinson's disease. So these sort of non-motor things the DBS will not will not give you benefit with. Okay, I just put this up here, just looking at the different treatment options for PD. Um, I'm just going to focus today on deep brain stimulation, but knowing that there's there are other treatments out there, and I'm sure most of you are are aware of them. Okay, so what are the the benefits of DBS? The first benefit is that it keeps the brain tissue intact. It, the DBS does not destroy portions of the brain or brain cells or nerve cells. It's completely reversible. If we turn off the DBS and rem or remo remove the electrode, you go back to exactly the way you were before surgery. Nothing is destroyed or changed in your brain. This leaves open the option um, in the, for future treatments, if something was um, discovered in the near future, um, you could have your DBS removed. It doesn't damage your brain and go on and have another, another different type of treatment uh, if one was available. It can be performed on both sides of the brain. So if you have symptoms on both sides of your brain, you can, you can have DBS for both the left side of your body and the right side of your body. With some of the other treatments, like focused ultrasound, which I know has been, um, uh, we hear a lot of patients talk about it now, focused ultrasound can only be performed on one side of your body, usually the dominant side. Um, so if you're left-handed, it would be your left, thought, left, left hand or your left body side that they would, they would do focused ultrasound for. If they do focused ultrasound on both sides of your body, then there's a higher risk of side effects. Uh, such as things that would affect your speech, your swallowing, your thinking, and your cognition. So uh, currently now, they'll only do focused ultrasound on one side of your body. So DBS we can do for both. Okay. It's beneficial long term. It does not stop being useful down the road, uh, and it's not time limited. We have patients that have been implanted for many years, 10 years plus, some, some longer, you know, 15 years or more, and they're still receiving benefit from their, their deep brain stimulator. It may not be as powerful benefit as they had initially as their disease has progressed, um, but they still receive benefit. And with our stimulator, we are able to adjust it to try to keep up with some of their, their symptoms. So we can adjust it over time to, to try to keep up with, with the symptoms that people experience as the disease progresses. Okay. It provides 24-hour symptom control. And one of the most common comments that we hear after we turn on a, a deep brain stimulator is, I was able to get up to the bathroom by myself in the middle of the night, and I haven't been able to do that for a long time. Um, so even if you're not taking your, if your last dose of medication is at 10 o'clock at night, the stimulation provides an underlying um, benefit like so that uh, you still are able to move in the middle of the night it may not be um, as good as when your pills are on board but you still are able to to move and it's tailored to your symptoms so there's many things that we can try and do to keep your symptoms under control so if if we turn on the stimulator and we set it and then you come back and say that you've got tremor in your arm we can adjust the stimulator to try to try to capture that. And there's many different things that we can do with our stimulator. Um, more than just adjust one parameter, there's many different parameters that we can adjust and work with to try to um, keep up with symptoms. Okay. I think, yeah, and I did talk about it being performed on both sides of your brain. Yeah. Okay. So who would be a good candidate for DBS? Well, You've had Parkinson's for at least five years, and that gives us a that uh, it allows us to uh, be sure that Parkinson's is your underlying diagnosis that it's not uh, a Parkinson's-like syndrome. So five years is usually what we say. You have on-off fluctuations, and by on-off fluctuations, like I explained earlier, you take your meds, you turn on, 
uh, you may get dyskinetic and then you go off again before your next dose and you cycle through the day on and off. You have a disabling tremor or you're unable to tolerate or increase your Parkinson's medications due to side effects. Like I said, the, if you've got bad dyskinesias, some people will not take higher doses of pills because they know they'll become increasingly or severely dyskinetic. And your symptoms interfere with your daily activities. So on the other hand, some of the contraindications to, to DBS would be if you have one of the Parkinson's plus conditions, um, Lewy body dementia, um, uh, uh, multiple system atrophy, uh, you know, some of the symptoms, some of the diseases that have symptoms similar to Parkinson's disease, these conditions tend to deteriorate fairly quickly, so they're, they're, they don't work well with, with DBS. If somebody has dementia or poor cognition, we, we would probably choose not to implant there's a lot of instructions that go along with DBS uh, when we ask you to adjust the stimulator. So uh, somebody that's not able to understand the instructions may not be a good candidate. And sometimes if somebody's cognition is poor and they undergo a surgical procedure, sometimes we can worsen the cognition. So we, we look at this and we don't have a, 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 a a true cutoff of when we will and won't do surgery. It's on an individual basis, but we do look at your cognition. If you have a poor functional state when your medications are kicked in, uh, for example, if you have freezing a gait while your while your medications are kicked are, are on, um, we're not going to fix that. Uh, your best on that you have on medication is what we will be able to achieve with DBS. So if you have problem with on-time freezing, we're not going to fix that with DBS. As well, if you have other health concerns, uh, such as cardiac disease or any other underlying health conditions that may uh, limit your ability to have surgery, we might think, um, might delay the tr uh, implantation of the DBS or we might uh, not choose to implant if we are worried that we could we could make you um, worse. Okay, what about age? This is a, another question that we get a lot of. Um, some centers around the country and some centers across North America um, they do have age cutoffs for DBS. At uh, VGH we don't have an age cutoff. We look at the overall health of the person coming in. Um, and you know it's it's true we sometimes see healthier seventy five year olds who are healthier than some fifty year olds that come into the clinic. So we look not just at your age, but we look at your overall health when we make a decision for DBS. So we don't we don't um, have a cutoff for age. Okay. So what makes you a good candidate for DBS? Let me just go back here. So if, if your neurologist thinks that you, you might benefit from DBS, uh, they will refer you to a neurosurgeon. And we're really lucky in British Columbia that we have very good neurologists um, that work with our Parkinson's patients. And they are really good about um, knowing who potentially is a really good candidate for DBS. So we'll get Dr. Honey will get a referral from the neurologist. And bring you into an in for an appointment in um, his office um, and at that appointment Dr. Honey will meet with you and your family to decide if DBS will help your symptoms and what type of DBS might be most appropriate for you which brain target are we going to use uh, he'll explain the surgery its benefits and its risks he'll answer any questions that you have about DBS um, he'll also, if he thinks that you, you're probably a good candidate, he'll refer you for an MRI and other tests that might be needed uh, uh, pre, for pre-surgical. He'll also refer you to the DBS clinic where we will do a preoperative assessment. Okay. At the DBS clinic, you'll undergo a variety of different tests to determine whether or not your symptoms will respond to DBS. 
We spend a lot of time in the clinic talking to you, trying to tease out information to ensure that your symptoms will be helped by DBS. We look at your physical health, your emotional health, your living situation, um, and other factors that you have going on in your life. We may do some, some motor testing as well. Um, you may have heard of a Levodopa challenge. That's where we have you come off your Parkinson's medications um, the evening before you come to the clinic. You come in off your pills. We do some motor testing in the clinic. We'll have you walk, we'll have you tap your fingers, um, do various movements off your pills and then we'll have you take your medication and then we repeat the test and see how, how your body responds to the medication. Your best on, on your medication is gonna be the best that we will see with DBS. So we'd like to see what symptoms you come in with uh, off your medication and how do they respond when you take your, when you take your Cinemet. If tremor's your main concern, we may do some tremor testing. Um, and sometimes we may do a variety of different tests if we're not entirely sure which would be the best target for you. After we do that sort of physical testing, we also do a memory test. Uh, we want to get a just a, a, a just a baseline of where your memory is. And if we have any concerns about it, we will refer you on to neuropsychological testing uh, for a more in-depth um, evaluation. And then we also do various quality of life measurements as well. Okay. Uh, we look at all these factors when we make a decision about potential DBS candidates. And it's, it's a bit like um, uh, making sure all the pieces fall into the right spots to ensure that, um, that it'll be a good fit for you. Once we finish our assessment in the clinic, we will meet with Dr. Honey and together with Dr. Honey and the rest of our DBS team, we discuss the results of your testing and what, what target is, is this the appropriate target for you or would you be better suited with another target? So we, we have quite in-depth discussions at our meetings to ensure that we're giving you the best um, uh, treatment uh, that will give you quality of life after surgery. So what are the brain targets? There's three brain targets that we use. If motor fluctuations are your biggest concern, then we would implant into what we call the subthalamic nucleus. You may hear it called the STN, and that's it right there. If tremor is your biggest uh, concern, then we would implant into an area called the thalamus. And then if dyskinesias are your, are your issue, then we would implant it to an area called the GPI or the globus pallidus. So those are the three targets that we use for Parkinson's disease. Okay. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about what happens during surgery and during DBS. I know there's a lot of resources out on the internet that uh, show different things and what different centers do. Um, and every center has their own way of doing things. So I'm just telling you how we do it here at Vancouver General Hospital. The information is fairly similar, but there might be just slight variations depending on the center, uh, center uh, different centers. Okay. Currently uh, in British Columbia, Dr. Honey is the only surgeon that's doing deep brain stimulation. Um, so unfortunately you have to come to Vancouver to have your surgery. Surgeries right now are being done at UBC Hospital, and which we all like out there. It's a nice, it's a nice hospital um, for our, our patients. Depending on the type of DBS surgery that you are having, you may be admitted to the hospital the night before surgery or very early the next day. You'll have to be off all your Parkinson's medications the night before surgery. So if you have difficulty moving off your pills, it's sometimes easier to be admitted to hospital than the night before than trying to get to the hospital for 6 a.m. the next morning off your pills. Once you are admitted the day of surgery, 
the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to go down to the MRI department and they're going to attach this frame to your head. Okay. So the day begins in the MRI department where this special frame is attached to your head. The purpose of this frame is to keep your head from moving during surgery. This frame is uh, attached to the operating room bed and it'll keep your head extreme. You can cough, you can sneeze, you can move your arms or your legs, your head's not going to move. So it keeps your head stable during surgery. You don't have to worry about um, trying to keep your head still. This frame is attached to your head with four small pins and you can see there's two bars on the front here and you can see these little pins in the front and then on the back there's the same thing there's two pins on the back okay. the pins are the pin sites are injected with local anesthetics so that you will be pain free once this frame goes on uh, you're going to have an MRI before they put you in the MRI they're going to attach another frame on top of the frame that you have so this is what it looks like and this is a picture of it actually on top of that the the frame that we put on with the pins okay this frame that you have put on has markers on it and when they do the MRI those market markers show up on 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 the films and they help plan the trajectory needed to get to the specific brain target okay so this frame just goes on temporarily while you're in the MRI and then they take it off after the MRI and you're you're left with just this piece for the rest of the surgery. Once the MRI is done, you'll go up to the pre-op holding area while Dr. Honey takes your MRI and plans the surgery based on your specific anatomy that he sees in, in your MRI, see the pre-op one and the one you have the morning of surgery. He uses the MRIs plus the special computer software to identify the precise target within the brain. And then he dials the coordinates in on this frame here. And this is just, uh, when you come into the OR, you'll probably see this frame set up on this base where they, they actually dial in the coordinates and do a test. And this is this is the target right here that they're going for. And then during the surgery, they'll put this frame on your head when they're ready to put the electrode in with those coordinates dialed in so they know exactly where they're going. Okay. The first part of the surgery where we place the electrode is called you may hear it called stage one of DBS. That's where we're putting in the electrode. Okay. And you'll be awake for this part of the surgery. Okay. Once you're in the operating room, the surgeon will shave and wash your head with special soap to kill any germs. He'll numb parts of your skull with anesthetic so that you won't feel any pain. They'll make an incision in, over the top of your head. We usually make two little incisions if you're having uh, surgery on both sides of your brain or if just on one, they'll do just a little incision on one side of your head. And then what he's gonna do is take a, a special surgical drill and drill two little holes in the top of your head, about the size of a dime, okay? And again, if you're having surgery just on one side of your body, it'll be one hole. But if you're having surgery for both body sides, there'll be two holes. Okay, and they, they drill them both at the same time if, if you're having surgery for both sides on the same day. Okay. The drilling does not hurt. I think this is what most people are, this are most um, worried about is, is the drilling. The drilling doesn't hurt. There's no nerve endings in your skull. However, the sound is very loud. Um, it's, it's like a dentist drill only, only magnified and you're, you're, you're hearing it in your head. The only good thing about it is it lasts only about 60 to 90 seconds and then it's over. So it's a short period of time, but it's, 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 it's loud. Okay. Once the holes are drilled, the neurosurgeon will take in the electrode and he will put the electrode into the, into the, the holes that he's drilled 
and he'll he'll um, advance it down so that the tip is in the proper area of the brain that we're that we're targeting, and then he's going to give you a little bit of stimulation through that electrode, and see how the see how your brain cells react. Okay, and at this point we may ask you how you're feeling. This is why we need you awake because we need to see you symptomatic in the OR so that when we turn on the DBS in the OR and we, we ask you to tap your fingers or um, we feel for rigidity, we know that we've hit the right target if we see the rigidity go away or if you're able to now move your hand up and down uh, quickly like your medications are working. So if you're asleep, we, we can't see that. So we need you awake so that we can see your reaction to turning on the stimulator in, in the operating room. You may feel a little numbness and tingling as, as we adjust the st stimulator up in, in the operating room, um, but anything that, uh, any sort of side effect that we cause in your, like tingling of your hand, changes in your vision, uh, we just back down the stimulator and it goes, goes completely away. Okay. Once they have the electrode in the right spot, they'll lock it in place with a little plastic cap. They'll move over and do the same thing on the other side if you're if you're having the second side done, okay? And then they're gonna use stitches to close up the incisions on the top of your head. And then at that point, they're gonna take that, that frame off your head. Okay. The second part of the surgery is where they place the extension wires and the, the neurostimulator in, in your chest. And this is called stage two. In some centers, they put the electrodes in on one day and then bring you back a few days later and put the battery or the neurostimulator in your chest. Um, at VGH, we put everything in at the same time. So you have the first part of the surgery, which takes about three to five hours where they're putting in the electrodes in your brain. And then after they get the electrodes in, they're going to give you a general anesthetic and put the battery in the same day, okay? It's about a 45 minute procedure to do this. So the anesthetic is very short. And what happens here is that the neurosurgeon will connect the extension wires to the electrodes and then tunnel the wire underneath the skin of behind one of your ears, down the side of your neck, to your chest, below the collarbone. And then he's gonna make a little incision and implant the battery in that spot. All right, so you'll have Four in, three to four incisions after your surgery. You'll have one or two on top of your head, depending if they're doing both sides or just one side. You'll have a small incision behind your ear where they connect the electrodes to the extension wire. And then you'll have another incision in your chest where the battery is, is located. So I just want to play this little video that just, uh, let me see here, just kind of goes over the surgical procedure very quickly. Turn it on here. All right, so you can see the electrode going into the target. It's being locked into place with a little cap. And this is, there's the cap going on. And there's part of the electrode. And they're coming down to the chest. Oh, sorry. They're tunneling the wire down behind your ear, down to your chest. placing the battery and then coming back up to the top and they're taking the ends of the electrodes and they're plugging them into the extension and then closing up the top and they're showing the system turned on okay. all right so Battery is not turned on right away after surgery. The battery is left off for about six weeks. Uh, we need time for your brain to heal after the surgery. As well, there, what can happen from just placing the electrode into the, the 
target is we can disrupt cells in that area and your symptoms may be slightly lessened for can be a couple hours, it can be a couple days, it can be a couple weeks. So you may find after surgery that you uh, may not need to take as medication as much medication for a few days or if you have tremor as your main symptom, your tremor has uh, disappeared or has um, dampened and you're able to use your arm where you couldn't before but by about six weeks time your your symptoms should be back to baseline and we need to see you back to baseline to be able to program the stimulator because if, if we don't see any symptoms we don't know what we're we're trying to to fix so um, stimulator is kept off initially okay. All right, so after you have the DBS implanted, you, you usually are in hospital for about one to day, two days after surgery. You have a CT scan the morning of your surgery and then usually a visit from the DBS clinic and we'll go over all your discharge instructions as well as your appointment to come back to the clinic. Okay. You may be a little bit headachey, um, but generally most patients feel not too bad after surgery. A lot of our patients do go home the day after surgery once their MRI has been completed. Or sorry, their, their CT scan the day after surgery. Yeah. Okay. We'll also give you an appointment to come back to the DBS clinic where we're going to turn on the simulator in six weeks. So these are some of the members of our team. Um, Dr. Honey, of course. We have a clinical fellow in the office. This is Dr. Hart who um, is here with us for a year. He's a trained neurosurgeon um, from uh, Cambridge and he's learning DBS with Dr. Honey. And then of course the nurses in the clinic, Minnie, um, some of you may recognize, she's been in the clinic since it started, myself and then Natasha. You may also see Leah, she's one of our research coordinators that uh, sometimes is involved with some of our patients. In the DBS clinic, at the first appointment, when you come to the clinic, we're going to turn on the simulator. So it's recommended that you bring a family member with you because this can be um, a tiring, tiring day. You're going to be in the clinic for about two to four hours where we turn on the simulator. And there will be lots of information that we give you at that appointment. You may, to, you may need to be off your Parkinson's medication for this approach. However, we will let you know if that is the case. Okay. Um, and after we turn on the stimulator, you'll need to come back to the clinic for adjustments. Um, some patients that we see, if we're implanting in the STN, which is for the on and off fluctuations, they need to come back to the clinic on a weekly basis for about six weeks after we turn on the stimulator. And that's because we're fine-tuning the stimulator, bringing it up as we're bringing your medications down till we find a nice balance of medication and stimulation that gives you good uh, movement through, good consistent movement throughout the day. And then after we get the stimulator set, uh, you'll come back to see us uh, usually in six months time where we'll check everything out and then after that on a yearly basis where we check the stimulator settings, we um, make sure that the electrical is all, the electrical system is all intact and check the battery level to be sure that um, the battery is still um, working fine and has lots of time left in it. Eventually in about three to five years after the initial battery is put in, you will need to have the battery changed and the, the DBS itself um, will, will give us a warning when it's running low and we will show you how to check for that when you're in the clinic. So programming the stimulator, um, right now the DBS clinic until very recently was the only center in British Columbia that could do any DBS programming. Now we're lucky to have a neurologist on Vancouver Island that can do some adjustments of the stimulator as well. But generally when we turn on the stimulator it's done at the DBS clinic and then subsequent follow-ups if you live on the island and prefer to be seen there because it's closer to home, um, can be done at that neurologist's office. 
And this is sort of what we do when you're in the clinic. We have a handheld programmer and we have uh, a little device that we put around your neck and it sits over top of the battery and that's how we program the stimulator. So you don't have to put it underneath your clothes or anything special. You can just, we just put it over top of your, your clothes and it um, connects with the battery and we do the programming that way. And this is just a, a better picture. You can see this is the, the, the piece of equipment that sits over top of the battery. And this is just a weight to, to keep it balanced on your, on your chest. This is our programmer. And you can see on my programming here, um, this is the electrode in the particular target. In this one, it says it's in the left FCN. Um, and you can see the contacts. You know, remember when I showed you on that um, picture with the dime, there was four little segments. These are the, the segments. You can see their name, number zero, one, two, and three. We can stimulate any of these contacts along this electrode. And we can change not only the contact that we use, but we can also change the voltage. You can't really see it here, but we can change um, what we call the frequency or the microsecond, how many microseconds, how many times per second, um, or uh, it's the strength of the signals that we're, we're, we're delivering, as well as the rate, which is the how many times per second the, um, the stimulator fires. So there's a variety of different things that we use when we're programming a DBS. And this is just a picture of what it might look like. Um, this is a 3D model, but this, this purple is the electrode. These little sort of white things are the contacts, and this is showing them within a structure of the brain. And when we turn it on, that ball that you saw on that the previous slide hopefully stimulates within this area to control your symptoms. This is another question that we get a lot of is, will my medication change after surgery? Because I know a lot of people are taking a lot of medication and um, it's one thing that people always hope to cut back on. The answer isn't a simple yes or no. Um, the answer is maybe. Okay. With certain DBSs, we can decrease your medication. For example, if we're putting the electrode in the subthalamic nucleus or the STN, and this is for the people that are having the on and off fluctuations, it is possible for us to decrease your medications. Generally, we say up to 40%, but that is just a, a generalization. It might be a little more, it may be a little less. It just depends on how your body reacts to the stimulation and um, the decrease in medication. So we say 40%, but that that's just, uh, just an, a number. If you're having surgery for dyskinesias you, you're, and you're, you're taking a little bit less medication than is optimal uh, to prevent severe dyskinesias, we probably wouldn't reduce your medication. We would leave it the same or we may even be able to increase the medication because you're now not having dyskinesias and it allows us to push a little bit more medication to manage your symptoms. If you're having surgery for tremor, this is another name for thalamus, we call it the VIM. It's, it's a, one of the structures within the thalamus. So this is for tremor surgery. There's a possible reduction in PD medication if your other symptoms are controlled on lower doses of medication. So for most patients that have tremor, tremor is the predominant symptom. They still have other motor issues with slowness and stiffness, but maybe not as bad as people that have um, the severe mo um, on and off fluctuations. So they may be able to pull back a little bit of their medications if their other symptoms are controlled on a lower dose of pills. Okay. And remember that um, the reason why we can't always pull back on your medication is that the, the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease uh, often need some medication to help with these symptoms. So if we pull back too much medication, then 
we sometimes can worsen some of these symptoms down here. Okay. So realistic expectations after DBS, just remember it's, it's not a cure for Parkinson's disease. We're just managing the symptoms and we're hoping to provide you with a better quality of life and allow you to get back to activities that you enjoy doing and enjoy enjoy your life. People often ask, what sort of things can I do and can't I do after DBS? Pretty much you can do anything. However, there's certain activities that we do like you to avoid. If you had a really hard blow to the chest over the battery or a really hard knock to the head where the electrodes are, you could potentially damage them, but it would take a pretty hard um, hit to do so. So we advise you to avoid such activities as bungee jumping, skydiving, or any sort of tackle sports. But pretty much, you can, if you're a golfer, you can go back to golf. We have people go back to skiing, um, back to all the activities that tennis, any sort of activity that you enjoy, you can, if you did it before DBS, you can do it after. Okay. So there are some risks with DBS and these are the surgical risks and these are things that Dr. Honey or the neurosurgeon that you're, you're um, seeing for DBS would explain to you. So any surgery, there is a risk. Um, so I'm just putting them out there so that you can see that there are some risks. Um, probably the biggest thing that we see, and we don't see it very often at all, is infection of the um, uh, the incisions after surgery. But we instruct you very carefully how to care for them um, after surgery so that we keep that at a very, very low level. There are some recent advances in DBS that are coming down the, the pipeline, and we keep hearing about it and we can't wait to see it, but one thing that uh, we have seen are what we call directional leads. So these are leads, or, or electrodes, I should say. Um, these are electrodes where you can actually steer the current in the brain. So if, if we're stimulating the DBS and we run into a side effect, then we can steer away from that side effect and provide you benefit. Often it's side effect that prevents us from increasing the stimulation to a point where we can provide benefit over time. So if we can steer away from that um, side effect, it gives us a little more um, to work with. There's also eight contact leads. And what I'm seeing about these eight contact leads is if somebody has bad tremor and also has bad motor fluctuations, they can try to angle the electrode in such a way that it will hit the tremor center as well as um, the STN, so the thalamus and the, and the STN for motor fluctuations. So you might be able to better capture symptoms um, using a longer electrode. Another thing is right now for your appointments at the DBS clinic, you have to come into the clinic uh, physically uh, because our, our programmer has to be in contact a certain amount of distance away from from the patient. So um, there's new technology coming down the pipeline. It's not here yet, where you'll be able to, we'll be able to make some changes over the, over the phone or through a Bluetooth connection of some type. And the last thing that is, we've been uh, hearing about is adaptive DBS. So this would be similar to a cardiac pacemaker. So the DBS kicks in when it sees a symptom. So if you're sitting quietly, doing nothing, it's off. And then if you moved your arm and normally you tremor, the DBS would kick in at that point. So these are all things that are, are in the works. And hopefully we'll be seeing them fairly soon. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you video here. Uh, this is a one of our patients and he's graciously given us, um, oh no, I'm showing you a different video, I'm sorry. This one I couldn't get to work. This is a, a video of turning on a deep brain stimulator. This is a this is a tremor pa patient. I'm just going to turn this on. You can see if anything feels uncomfortable. Let me know the tremor in the right arm. And this is an old DBS system. You can see there's a wire connecting between the programmer and the patient. This is the pro the, the programmer on his chest, and it's been turned on. 
you should see in a second. As I increase the voltage, you sometimes get a little buzz as the voltage increases. And I can tell we haven't stopped anything. With the We're slowly increasing the voltage here. And you can see the tremor in his right arm is starting to dissipate. Stop. Hold you. I want you to go back and forth to my finger. Back to your nose. To my finger. Back to your nose. Hold on my finger. Rest your both hands on the back. Put your arms up in front of you. And then just come into hold you. Good. And relax. That's at one and a half volts. Still a little tiny bit of tremor there, but we've slowed it down mm. substantially there. So you can see for this patient what a difference it would make in the quality of his life being able to um, now use his right hand to um, feed himself, um, being able to write again uh, and perform other activities that he, he uh, enjoys doing. So DBS, that's, I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them at this time. Thanks so much, uh, Nancy, a very informative presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat box here. We have one from Terry, um, and he's asking, what determines if there is the requirement to have implants on one side or both sides of the brain? Yeah, so typically, the only time we would implant on one side of the brain is if tremor was your, your, your predominant symptom. Um, if you have motor fluctuations where you're going cycling on and off or dyskinesia, so usually on both sides of the body, so we would implant on both sides of the body for, for motor fluctuations and dyskinesia. But some people that have tremor may only have tremor in their predominant um, in, in one side. So we may, uh, for those patients, just implant one electrode for the side that's giving them bothersome tremor. Thank you. And Arlene is asking, are there any outside factors that can impact the DBS, such as me metal detectors, full body scanners, or further MRI scans, for example? Yeah. So after you're implanted with DBS, we, we go over per precautions with the stimulator in. There's certain things we ask you to avoid when traveling in the airport. We don't want you going through the, um, the airport scanners. For example, we ask you to have a, you know, to ask for a hand pat down instead. Uh, with MRIs, most DBS systems nowadays are compatible with MRI. The only caveat right now is if you need an MRI, you have to come to Vancouver General to have that MRI done because our equipment, the DBS equipment, has to be checked before and after a scan. And right now, because we only have the DBS clinic in Vancouver, um, unfortunately, you have to come here for your MRI. But they can, they, you, but they are compatible with MRI. Okay, great, thank you. And Keith is asking: I live in northern BC. Traveling back and forth will be expensive. How long will the whole procedure take, including the initial exam? Yeah, that that's a that's a big consideration um, because at present. There's only the clinic here, and then um, uh, Dr. Tuck on the island can do adjustments on DBSs. There's nobody in the northern part of BC or even in the Okanagan that can do DBS adjustments. So you need to come to the clinic for your initial assessment in the clinic with the nursing staff to do the testing. We, we absolutely um, need to see you for that. So that would be at least one day here. And then anytime you needed to come for an adjustment or to check the system, you would have to come to the DBS clinic. So on average, once we set up the, the stimulator and we've turned it on, you have a little remote and we'll put some range in that remote so you'll be able to make some adjustments on your own at home so you don't have to travel to the clinic any every time you need an adjustment. So we say once everything's set up, and working well, 
we say once a year just so that we can check the battery, check all the connections, make sure everything's working well. And then for battery changes in the future, you'll need to come down as well. Those are a day procedure where they change the DBS battery in your chest. However, it's, it, you know, you'll have to, if you're coming from out of town, usually the night before the day of surgery and most people go home the day after. So there are some, some expense factors involved with it, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. And Peggy is asking, what is the typical waiting time for those patients who are accepted for surgery? Right now, our, our waiting list is not very long at all. The, the block is getting to see the, the surgeon. But once you're, you've seen the surgeon and have seen the DBS clinic, the wait is well under six months. So probably within a couple months, you would have your surgery. And Warren is asking, have you any news of non-invasive DBS through stimulation outside the skull? The, the, the thing that's being most talked about right now, again, is the focused ultrasound. Um, as far as non, and they're, they're working all, on all sorts of things. Uh, there's trans, um, transcranial, um, I can't remember the name of it now, but the, the procedure where they, they can do it through your skull. As far as modulating movement with non-invasive DBS, I haven't heard a lot of it. There's, there's stuff that's out there, but, um, uh, not in the mainstream at this point yet. Thanks, Nancy. And Ben is asking, is DBS covered by Canadian healthcare? Yes, 100%. All right. Um, don't see any other questions. Oh, one more here, Donna Smith. I had, I had GPI, Boston Scientific, eight contacts for dystonia last year in Toronto, was taking 12 levodopa pills before and after surgery, but not taking any meds now as they were making my neck dystonia worse. I have freezing of gait now due to DBS. Do you have any comments? That, that could, can be a side effect of certain types of DBS. Um, and what we, we it's, a, it's, it's a known side effect to have that freezing of gait with usually GPI DBS, and what we do in that case is we, adjust, we readjust the stimulator and we can usually get away from that, yeah. Okay, I think that was our last question. I'll just wait one second here just in case any others come through. I don't see anyone typing. Um, so I wanna say thank you again, Nancy. Um, as I said, that was very informative and very helpful, I am sure, to our viewers today. And thank you all for attending. Um, this will be posted on our website along with the slides. Uh, oh, Nancy, we do have yeah. one other question. If you have time. Yeah. Does DBS address dystonia? Yes, it can. Yeah. And Keith is asking, I'm hoping to stay at my daughter's. How long can she expect? Well, the recovery period, we usually say about six weeks recovery. Um, most people recover fairly quickly after surgery, but we do ask you to take it easy for about six weeks after surgery. We don't want you bending and lifting and um, doing a lot of um, running around. You will be tired, you will be fatigued, and you need time for your body to heal. So. I would say about six weeks after surgery. Okay, great. Well, thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Um, it is two o'clock, so I think we can wrap things up here. Um, you can access this on our website. Um, give us a few days and it will be posted. Thank you so much. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.